What you see in front of you is a spectrogram of a song by one Richard D. James, also known as Aphex Twin. A spectrogram is an alternate way of viewing a sound, whereas the waveforms that we're used to tells us the amplitude of any specific time, a spectrogram tells us the frequency content at any specific time. With points going higher from nothing to color to white tells us how much of a frequency is present. The name of the song is called Formula, but it's also known as Equation, and all of these names are really safety aliases for its original name given by Richard this bloody thing. But it does beg to question, if I proclaim that this is in fact an audible piece of data that I and you can hear, then how the bloody hell do computers even render audio? Also, if you do know what a spectrogram is and want to know how this is even possible, this video is pretty cool. It's in the description. It goes over different software that Aphex Twin used. Okay, let's go back to the video. Audio files are containers that hold a bunch of information, the first of which being information the computer needs, like what kind of file it is, how many channels, how big the file is. Then there's the actual audio data. This is for the wave format and different formats <coughs> are a bit more complicated if they're compressed, but we can stick to wave for now. Inside the data section, we have the binary data for our audio which are usually 16 bits or 24 bits of audio, meaning 16 or 24 ones and zeros represent one sample of audio data. Usually in audio files, the samples are interleaved, depending on how many channels the file is set for. In usual stereo or two channel setups, that means that the 16 bits are set up one for the left channel, then one for the right channel, and so on and so forth. But what is a sample of audio? All right, come on, let's go. When we record audio using a microphone, we have to convert that analog signal into a digital signal because there are theoretically infinite points between each point of the analog signal. And so we have to make discrete points for our digital signal. Each of these specific points is called a sample. The same thing can be said about the amplitude point, where we have to clamp the signal to have a specific value for the amplitude using a process called quantization. In doing so, we introduce noise since we can never perfectly represent an analog signal. But at a bit depth of 16 bits, each sample get 16 bits to represent itself, meaning we'd get 2 to the power of 16 possible values for this amplitude, aka 65,536 possible values, leaving 32,768 possible negative values, one zero value, and 32,767 positive values. Why are the positive and negative not the same? Shh. Now once we open any file via media player, or we're playing it through our door, or we're even making new sounds from our door to become the next Metro Boomer, a few things have to take place. Whenever audio is played, it first has to convert to raw PCM data. PCM data meaning pulse code modulated data or pulse code modulation, which is the standard in which audio is represented digitally. And this conversion has to happen everywhere, whether it's your uncompressed WAV file, your DAW, or an MP3, everything has to be decoded and or converted into PCM data. Whatever program you're using, DAW, Media Player, Spotify, they all convert the audio themselves, usually with a codec if need be, and send it off to our system's audio API. A codec, by the way, means an encoder decoder. Yeah, that's right. And it's a set of algorithms that well, I, I can't just set it. Different codecs exist for different encodings, and this happens in the video world as well. But for audio, all of these codecs have to convert whatever encoding we have into uncompressed PCM data. If our file was compressed before, no, it does not magically add back data you lost from compression. I, I'm sorry, mate, it's your loss. Now at the system API layer, let's actually go over what API stands for first. An API is an application programming interface. It's basically what gives programmers or nerds a way to talk to and use other programs. And for every operating system, there are different ones. Windows has Wasapi, which is short for Windows Audio Session API. There's also Direct Sound, although that's kind of deprecated. And for the game developers, there's X Audio too. Mac has Core Audio, and Linux has Jack, Ulcer, 
and Pipewire. And there are more I'm leaving out for Windows and Linux, but we don't have to go over them right now. In fact, we're gonna focus on Windows since that's what I'm guessing you're using and because it's also what I'm using right now since I don't have a Linux system right now. You know, I actually do sometimes attract to WIMP. The APIs are used by the OS to handle audio streams, handle the mixing of audio streams, and help add any unnecessary audio features that sometimes your OS turns on without you actually asking it to. On the Windows side, you'd most likely be using Wasapi nowadays, as stuff like direct sounds has been deprecated, but you might have also heard of ISO. ISO, or Audio Stream Input Output, is an API developed by Steinberg, or the Cubase people, to offer a low latency, highly accurate way of listening back to audio. It bypasses any icky operating system kernel stuff that Wasapi uses, doesn't do any mixing with any other application, and more or less goes straight to your sound card. Wasapi doesn't actually do any kernel mixing, but ISO basically just bypasses the whole kernel entirely, so. Now that doesn't mean you might not be able to hear the chill beats playlist you've put on while you make your not so chill beats, since it's basically a direct link between software and hardware, leaving everything else out. But there are some workarounds and you could also use ISO for all. And actually speaking of ISO for all, Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay, I get it. That's boring. You just wanna know how this gets to your ears. It's okay, I got I got you. I got you. It's okay. It's okay. Shh, 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 shh. If you wanna hear me go full on nerd, then check out my Patreon where I talk a little bit more in depth about it in full. And for the even nerdier among you, I'll be building a simple program using Wasapi all from scratch and recording my experiences. So if you want to learn along with me, and also probably go through a lot of pain because I'll be using either C or C++, then click the link in the description. Also, I'll chop out and create a shorter version for those who just want the code breakdown and to figure out my insights without actually having to watch my my downfall, but that'll also be included when you go to the link in the description. But when we're just using Wasapi, after audio gets sent from Wasapi, it gets sent to the Windows Audio Engine, where mixing and audio effects that you don't actually want to be there, but are added anyway on by default, take place. Actually, before going to the engine just yet, there are some things to note about the APIs. Like for instance, Wasapi has implemented exclusive mode as opposed to work like ISO on how it has an almost direct connection to the hardware by bypassing the mixer. Some people say one is better than the other. Unfortunately, there aren't any official tests, so it really depends on your hardware and your setup. X-Audio 2 also jumps to the audio engine, does some messing about, but goes back to Wasapi to know how to be mixed and then gets sent back to the engine. Yeah, I actually don't quote me on that, but that's apparently how it works. But once we leave API land, we're now in the audio engine. And although I've been saying sent to Wasapi, and you'd usually see the flow of audio in many charts like the, this one, this official one from Microsoft, Wasapi is just the interface on interacting with the audio engine, which is where all the stuff really happens. Mixing of all the Wasapi applications, sample rate conversion if the supplied sample rate does not match the output device, channel mapping if it has to down mix, or up mix depending on the output device. There's a bunch of other audio processes and places everything in an audio buffer it gets from the Windows driver model. If that feels like a little bit of a simplification, that's because it is. But my last video is like 25 minutes long. We have to like, we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're doing a little bit of a, we're doing a little bit of a fast one. A little bit of fast ones. So we're finally at the drivers. Yeah, a lot happens before then. And I'm purposely keeping this video short. Under the Windows audio driver stack, even more happens. Like, I, a, a lot happens. Do you see how many tabs I have open for this? <coughs> but to summarize, once it gets to the driver stack, the Wave RT driver is responsible for setting up the connection to the actual sound card. There are some other stuff filtered here and there to build the architecture and actually make it work. But the Wave RT is the main last step of getting it to the sound card by opening up a cyclic buffer. For other OS's, there are different implementations, but I'd imagine that it'd have a similar buffer setup as well. We'll use another official Microsoft diagram to explain this. This cyclic buffer has a play position and a write position. It's called a cyclic buffer as when these points get to the end of the buffer, it wraps back round. Therefore, we never need to allocate more memory, we can just keep using this buffer and writing over it when we need to. The right position is the location just past the last sample that the engine wrote to the buffer, while the play position 
is a sample that the audio device is currently playing through the speaker. Now our audio buffers filled with samples usually fits inside this cyclic buffer and the smaller our buffer of audio samples is, the faster that this process can go. However, it also increases computation time, which is where the trade-off between having a smaller buffer size for less latency but more computational load takes place. There's a bunch of other stuff on what bus is used to take the PCM data to the sound card and what driver that needs and what kind of memory this buffer is stored in, but that's just not in the scope of this video. I'll leave some resources, but it's just not something I'm going to cover today. I'll cover that the day I build my own drivers for my own sound card, okay? Okay. But now that we're out of driver land, we're reaching the sound card. It's basically a digital to analog converter that converts our digital audio into analog signals that causes the cone of the speaker to vibrate based on those analog signals. Sound we hear is just the vibrations in the air vibrating our eardrum. The speaker makes the vibrations, these vibrations vibrate our eardrums, we're happy. These analog signals really are the last part of the equation until it's sent to our speakers or headphones for them to vibrate. It's worth noting that digital to analog converters are pretty complex and the built-in ones to our motherboards, real tech, while great for the average consumer, comes with its own issues. <laughs> which is why many professionals would rather an audio interface, which you could essentially imagine being an abstracted sound card. And of course, if anything is abstracted for a singular purpose, it usually does it better than the one latched onto a multi-purpose device. But that's the entire pipeline of how computers render audio. It's pretty complex, there's a lot I'm purposely missing out, but at the same time, if I were to go that deep into how Windows does it, it kind of leaves you in the dark on how Linux or even Mac does it. Even though it's probably kind of similar in architecture, I'm not going to go into a full Windows specific, that's not the title of this I said computers. Not, not, not Bimblesoft. Here's the entire chart, you can look at it again, you know, just like look at it for a little bit, let it sink in. It should be noted that all of this takes place from the CPU side. The GPU does no work, but it might be in the future. There's been looking to GPU audio. It's probably not gonna come anytime soon, 100% to a stable market, but it's something to look into if you're interested. But speaking of graphics though, if audio samples showcase the amplitude at any given point, where does this weird frequency monster we saw come from? Well. In the digital realm, we usually have to convert our audio data, which is normally in the time domain to the frequency domain, which is where we can use the frequencies or sounds we have. And to do so, we'd have to use a complicated looking equation, which really isn't that hard to understand. You can learn more about it in this video here. 